All right, let's see. I hope this is it. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, this is my second time at Nano, so I appreciate the opportunity to present uh, to all of you. Uh, I'm with Finisar Corporation. Um, some of you may be familiar with the company. We're the largest uh, manufacturer of optical transceivers around the world. Uh, 14,000 employees we sell to ma mainly to system OEMs, but also to end users uh, such as yourselves. Uh, and today, I'm going to talk about different topic to what I normally do, which is uh, typically talk about optics, transceivers, and data center, and so on. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, specific issues that were found and solved in the open networking ecosystem with working with optical transceivers. Uh, specifically, what are some of the benefits uh, uh, for innovation, but also challenges for interoperability that open networking brings into our space, uh, and how something called open optical monitoring that we spearheaded, but it's an open stuff um, uh, effort that we did within OCP, uh, helped solve this problem. Uh, then I'm going to show you some application examples, uh, well, how you can use it, how you can um, um, access it and use it, and uh, some of the latest news for those of you that are already using it. <clears throat> so uh, let's first explain what the problem is, and uh, some of the basics, of, and I know um, all of you understand this, Traditional networking uh, ecosystem works. Uh, the system OEM, such as Cisco, Arista, or Dell, whoever it is, typically take care of a whole stack uh, in, in a switch, all the way from uh, procuring the optical transceivers, or even though that you can procure you know, separately, given that they're pluggable. Uh, but you know, they give you the cell, the, sw the switch, they integrate the uh, IC, the network IC, uh, the network OS, the applications, they're all part of the same package, fully vertically integrated, than that a system OEM gives you. So that means that all the integration uh, with the optics, which means the status and control information for the optical transceivers, is all taken care of by the system OEM uh, software. Uh, however, that changes when you go into an open networking ecosystem where disaggregation brings a lot of innovation and, and, and cost advantages. It brings also another set of complexities and challenges. So as you very well know, in the disaggregated model in open networking, you have a separate vendors for the optics, separate vendors for the white box, for the uh, silicon IC, uh, for the switching IC, that is, uh, also for the NOS, and of course, for all the applications, there could be hundreds of applications that uh, are available out there that have to make use of this fully now disaggregated model. So uh, things like standardization, interoperability among all these different elements in the, uh, in the ecosystem, open APIs uh, come into play. Uh, innovation is also one of the benefits, but again, we, if we take care of standardization, interoperability, and open APIs. And of course, the bottom three uh, at the you know, um, base of this is, as always, quality, reliability, and assurance of supply. You want something that's reliable, that works, and that is also available from multiple vendors or multiple sources. Uh, so let's talk about standardization for a minute, uh, which uh, open networking actually even make it more relevant. There are many standards out there uh, for different things. You have IEEE and things like T11, standardizing optical and electrical interfaces, uh, Ethernet, fiber channel, uh, OIF, uh, internetworking, uh, telecom interfaces. There's also the MSAs that govern transceiver form factors, things like SFF, CFP, QSFPDD now for 400G, OSFP. There are many different uh, MSAs that govern the mechanics and the electrical, in some cases, of the transceiver form factors. And then you have some of the MSAs, like CWDM4 and others, uh, that um, specify um, some optical applications for specific needs. So all of the standards actually are becoming even more relevant to make sure that transceivers talk to each other and that different transceivers from different sources work also in different white boxes. So let's do a brief aside and show what the state of the industry is, uh, in, in data centers in particular. And this is trying to encompass all kinds of data centers. Today, 10G uh, in the rack is still being deployed um, to, the, to the server uh, in the vast majority of data centers still out there. However, 25G has already uh, started to be deployed, uh, specifically in big hyperscale data centers, big clouds, but also other, other um, large enterprise, for example. And 50G and 100G, uh, next generation 100G, that's going to be the next interface for servers. And that standardization has already begun. It's ongoing, actually, within the IEEE. And you can expect the combination of both 50G and 100G in next generation servers. Again, first coming from the leading edge, which is always the, the large clouds, the large public cloud um, hyperscale data centers. 
between data center racks or switch to switch, 40G is still pretty much being deployed at many data centers. However, uh, 100G, as the previous speaker said, is massively being deployed now by the big clouds, um, 100G, QSFP 28s, um, multi-mole, single-mole, all kinds of different interfaces are being out there being deployed. And next generation speeds are already standardized. And actually, at 200G and 400G, the IEEE uh, BS task group um, uh, standardized or ratified, rather, 802.3 ratified uh, 400G standard a couple of weeks ago in Geneva. And they're now starting to work on next generation 400G uh, interfaces. Um, lower number of fibers, lower number of wavelengths, and so on for next generation 400G after initial deployments. So again, I'm gonna, not going to talk in, in detail about that effort today. It's a topic that I really like. So if you, any of you want to talk about it, please see me after, after, the, after the, uh, the talk, and we can, we can surely uh, discuss. <clears throat> then between data centers, DCI or anywhere in the one, uh, believe it or not, 10G tunable is still pretty much being deployed all over the world. However, the leading edge has been using 100G now, client interfaces so far, but also now coherent interfaces, coherent ACO or DCO, 100G, 200G for DCI applications. And next generation is going to be, of course, higher speed. So 400G is being standardized by OIF for next generation uh, data center interconnects. And, um, you know, optic vendors like CAS are looking beyond that. We're looking at 600G, even things beyond that for the next generation uh, of DCI deployments. Uh, so again, the summary is standardization, both in the optical interface side and the transceiver side. Uh, will become, will continue to be very important in an open networking environment, and it's important to give users the tools to identify the performance and make sure the performance of the transceivers meet those standards. So interoperability is a, it's a big uh, word, of course, in the open networking space. Um, the the um, organ, the group that has been uh, key in doing this is Open Compute. Uh, where a large combination of uh, NOS and switch cables, transceiver modules are continuously being tested um, for, for performance. Uh, the proven solutions are added at an open networking integrators list that's uh, widely available. And that testing occurs uh, within uh, the interoperability lab at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, that test is ongoing, it happens weekly. However, uh, there are a couple of plug fests that happen maybe once or twice a year. The last one was in May 2017. The focus there was 100G CWDM interoperability, but there are many different interfaces continuously being, being um, um, added. If you go to their website, you're going to see the list of combination of switch vendors, NOS, optics, and copper cables, all these different configurations that have been tested. So um, we, of course, participate in those, in those efforts, uh, as, you know, and, and it was actually there that the issue I'm going to talk about was identified originally, like three years ago. So the issue with, with optical transceivers is that all this flexibility that open networking provides uh, was having an effect on the type, on how you, uh, users could access the information inside the transceiver. And that information is both uh, static and dynamic. Um, static information, something called serial ID, that gives you information about uh, the module itself, the vendor, the uh, interface type, uh, which standard it meets. Uh, serial number, um, manufacturing code, and all kinds of uh, static information the transceiver has. There's also dynamic information about the link, transmitter and receive optical power, voltage, uh, temperature, and so on, which is important to gauge the performance of the link. All that information is typically read and reported by a system OEM. But again, it was getting lost now in the open networking ecosystem. There was no consistent way for the applications, for the end users ultimately, to access that in a standardized fashion. So it really depended on your combination of, of switch IC and, and which switch vendor, which white box vendor, and so on, and the NOS also. So again, each switch, each NOS had a different way of accessing that data. So that was really, that was really a problem um, early on. So ideally, what you want is something that provides, or a driver initially, uh, basically, that provides a standardized way to access all that data regardless of the implement, particular implementation uh, of your switch. And that's actually what we set out to fix in something we call open, op, open optical uh, monitoring that I'm, I'm going to discuss in, in the next few slides. So open optical monitoring is an OCP um, uh, project. Uh, we identified that issue and we started a, progr a, program, a project back in 2015. Uh, the sponsors, Finisar was one of them. As you can see, some of the other names are the big names in open networking. And the aim was to create a decoding layer, some kind of library that decodes uh, the um, 
low-level, if you will, data being read via I2C to the transceivers, uh, interfacing to the transceiver module, and converting, converting that into a northbound interface was an open API that could be read in, uh, that could be queried in Python. So uh, we kicked off that in 2015. Um, what it is is uh, we were now done with that, although improvement is continuous. It's basically a Python package that provides, as I said, a standard API that reads and writes to optical transceivers. That EEPROM information inside the transceivers is actually encoded or decoded in key value pairs, and it can be queried, as I said, obviously, in Python. It's the same API for all, uh, all any Linux-based uh, NOS, so any switch, any transceiver type, any, any transceiver vendor, as long as, as they meet the standards uh, in the MSAs, um, Oh, you know, via OOM, that transceiver can be queried or controlled in many cases. It's obviously open source, very easy to maintain and to extend. Now, here's an example of a few lines of code. I have more applications examples coming up, but that's basically what uh, what that could you know what you need to write to get the for in this case all the um, uh, status information of all the ports in the switch. So some high-level um, block diagram of how it works is essentially we provided actually both a decode library, oops, a decode library called the OOM decode library that's already um, out there, and also uh, most recently a universal optics driver that, uh, that can provide a multi uh, access actually to the, to the I2C interface uh, for a multiplicity of um, switch um, and uh, white box combinations, and I have some information on that coming up. So a few technical details, and again, I'm an optics guy, so this is, I have to uh, trust our, our software guys who gave me this, uh, this uh, slide. So the decode library is table driven. Uh, each key has a location, a decode function for that key value pair. Uh, there is also a certain decode functions for specific data formats. We do all that as part of the OOM uh, library. For example, the, the temperature information of the transceiver is encoded in a 16-bit two, uh, two, two's complement value in, you know, uh, in units of one over 256 degrees. That's just the way that the MSA defined it in EEPROM. And all that conversion is done to just degrees by, by that library. Uh, it also includes collections of keys, so you can query groups of, um, of parameters at the same time. So things like serial ID or DOM actually returned a, you know, a set of uh, in optical uh, performance information for that port. The driver that we've actually contributed most recently is a standard Linux uh, kernel driver, and it can support any transceiver, standard transceiver, SFP or QSFP. Uh, and again, it access uh, the EEPROM using the Linux I2C APIs that already exist out there. And it's a very universal driver and actually a little bit more comprehensive than some of the others that the white box manufacturers have, have provided. And again, this is now part of the OCP um, project, uh, OOM. Some examples of, of uh, how you would access uh, information on the port. So the first uh, bullet point there gets a list of all the ports in a switch um, after you, you call, of course, that OOM library. Um, the second example, the second bullet point, you get a specific uh, parameter or a specific value for a specific parameter you're looking for. Or alternatively, as shown in line number three, you could get a collection of parameters by invoking, um, the, in this case, the DOM um, uh, function. Uh, as you can see on the example on the right, uh, so those three simple lines will get you all the info. And again, if you had 32 ports, you will get 32 lines of all the uh, optical information on that uh, particular box. You can also run it over the network. There are some implementations that uh, using uh, JSON, uh, you can actually run it over the one. So for things like remote monitoring or remote uh, uh, maintenance of your network, uh, this can actually uh, be also queried um, over the network. So what is this good for? What applications? Well, the applications are very similar to what people use in today uh, in, in the standard you know, system OEM uh, paradigm. So you could do things like inventory, where you uh, track and you verify uh, the transceiver types, what you think you have versus what you really have, um, the optical interface in those transceivers, serial numbers, manufacturing date code, and so on for warranty purposes. You can do health monitoring. You can read, uh, as I showed before, 
um, information on the TX and RX optical power. You can track that in real time, so you can see trends. If that optical power is coming up or down, it could indicate that something, a port is dirty, for example. Temperature, um, alarm and warning thresholds could also be monitored to make sure that they are adequately uh, configured uh, for those uh, boxes that you can, where you can actually configure those thresholds. Diagnostics, this means actually network diagnostics. So there are ways that you could actually change the, the DOM information and also those uh, alarm and warning thresholds to segment performance uh, across your network. And you can see things like, you know, if a fiber link, for example, is getting too close to the, to the, to the maximum edge, right? If the link budget is getting too close to what the, the, the fiber uh, link can support. So you can do some pro pro proactive maintenance and diagnostics of your network. And then custom uses, and this is where innovation comes into play. There is um, different transceiver vendors like ourselves or others can actually provide uh, innovative new features in those transceivers. Before, in the you know, traditional paradigm, you would have to go through a system OEM. They'll take two years to qualify the feature. They try to get a second source for the feature and so on, which is great because it makes sure that thing works very solidly, but it takes a long time. So innovation can now happen much more rapidly. We can get to the end user right away in an open networking model, and we can allow you to control or get status of that new feature by using um, you know, the standard EEPROM in the transceiver, and you can read that via, via Python. You can create your own applications from day one um, with an open API. So again, some, quickly some examples of what all of this look like. This is a, an example of an inventory uh, where you get, this is only shows five of the, uh, of the parameters, but there are actually literally tens of parameters of static information, also called serial ID that you can get from a transceiver. And this, again, is uh, what the, uh, the Python code would look like. Uh, very straightforward to get a list of, of ports. Similarly, for health monitoring, and this is a simple GUI we created where we show, um, in this case, four of the parameters and the alarm and warning thresholds, but you can create your own applications, obviously, to display all the metrics of the, that optical link. Again, very easy to get uh, a list of that, uh, all those parameters for all the ports in the switch. Diagnostic, very similarly. Um, I can talk about in detail about some of this uh, offline if you like, um, about some of the implementations some of our customers have done. In this case, you need vendor tech support, which means optical vendor tech support to, to change things in the transceiver to allow uh, this segmentation of performance and be able to more diagnose network uh, performance at the network level, not just at the transceiver level. And then, as I mentioned, the, the custom uses this is an example uh, where, for example, um, um, through Python, you can actually light up the pull tab in a transceiver right, you know, to identify a specific transceiver uh, out there in the field. You can actually, VI square C, which again is done via Python now, you can actually say, you know, transceiver in port two of switch number three, please start blinking. So somebody on the floor can actually remove it. So this is a kind of innovative new feature that can, can be implemented very rapidly and brought to market very rapidly uh, and implemented using, um, using OOM. We've shown this a couple of times already at the OCP summits back in 2016 and 17. Uh, again, some of these applications are shown uh, that I mentioned, I show in the GUI there. And I can, I can talk about this in detail for anyone who's interested. And <clears throat> then how can you access it? If you're interested in playing with it, it's all open and, and free, of course. It's part of uh, OCP. You can go to the Git, OCP GitHub. Um, the code is there. You can download it, use it, improve it. Please share your use cases with us, with us in, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the project. Um, it, it is being done in interoperability testing uh, within the, the University of New Hampshire, as I mentioned, and it has been demonstrated uh, with multiple combinations of switches, NOS, and, and so on and so forth. There are about 200 keys already decoded for all types of transceivers that you can see there, uh, including more recently some CFP support, which is... Uh, it's still being used in, in, in routers primarily, not so much in switches. So some of the latest uh, OOM news for those of you that have been tracking this um, um, are part of OCP maybe. Uh, in the last year, we've uh, been, uh, introduced a universal Python shim. This was to solve a specific issue where um, it was needed to compile uh, C code to install OOM. That's not longer required. We then introduce CFP family support. Again, for those of you using this in routers, CFP, CFP2, CFP4 family was important support as well. The universal OptoE driver was released. Um, and again, this 
it can be used on any Linux-based NOS. Uh, it's actually, um, we believe, is, is, is better than uh, some of the existing drivers out there, which are more white box specific. This actually has more function, better functionality, more transceiver capabilities, EEPROM capabilities. And then most recently, um, OptoOE, that driver is now part of a couple of um, distributions. Uh, ONL distribution is being uh, used uh, in eight Acton switches and one Quanta switch. It's also in the Sonic distribution, being used by uh, two Acton switches and one Inventex switch. So that's uh, fresh off the press, actually, from a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so again, a large amount of interest uh, in, in OOM, in this part of the open networking uh, community. Uh, so feel free to, for those of you that are interested and relevant, go to the GitHub site, um, play with it, send us your feedback, ways we can improve it, or just improve it yourself and, and contribute to the project. That's what I had. I'd like to actually, uh, the real expert in this at Finisar is Don Bollinger. Uh, those of you attending the OCP Summit uh, next month, you will see Don, if he's uh, part of a, he's actually leading a panel. Uh, he also has a short presentation with more in-depth, specific um, technical information on some of the latest improvements in OOM uh, at the OCP Summit in San Jose coming up in March. So that's the end of my talk. Any questions? All right, if there are no questions, uh, I'm available to talk about any optical issues and topics. That's really my passion, so please find me in the hallway. Uh, if not, uh, other than that, thank you so much. Appreciate uh, the time again and the opportunity. Thank you.